Our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Once again, we welcome you to today's Bible study. And we are still in the book of Romans. This is, Bible study is coming to you from no other place but Dominion Church International Buya. And we ask you kindly to invite somebody to join us today. And we believe it will be a time of refreshing. It will be a time of revelation. In the presence of the Lord. Be blessed as you invite somebody. But before we begin, let's take this moment and dedicate it to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, you are welcome in this place. Yes, Lord. We thank you, King of Glory, oh, yes. that we get to have the opportunity mm. to sit under the Word, mm. the teaching of the Holy Spirit, mm. understanding Christ, mm. transforming our communities mm. through the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. Open our eyes to greater truth. Mm. Set us free mm. to run mm. in the freedom of the Word. Mm. We pledge that after all is said and done, mm the praise and the glory will be returned to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are in the book of Romans chapter 7. We shall read from verse 1 to verse 6. The text reads as follows. Or do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law. That the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another to him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law. Having died to what heard us. So that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. And not in the oldness of the later. In this chapter, like we stated in the previous week. The central theme is the relationship between the believer and the law of God. However, we must be very careful when we are talking about the law of God. Why? Because this chapter deals with very many notes. 
So, and all these knots need to be untied. Because if we do not untie them piece by piece, we end up coming up with false assumptions regarding our responsibility towards keeping the law of God. And we also pointed out in the scripture when you go through it you will discover the word law repeatedly being brought forward. And to that you add the word commandment. And this all presents you with an understanding of what it is that was handed over. So when we are looking at the law, we need to understand what is it that we were given and what is our responsibility as believers in Jesus Christ with respect to the law of God. So when we talk about the law of God, basically we are looking at the Old Testament law which was given directly to Moses. And we broke it down into three aspects. There is what we call the moral law and this is how to live deals with how to live a godly life or how to pursue holiness and part of this is rooted in the ten commandments that were given with a few exceptions most of the moral law is still applicable for us today. And the exceptions that I'm talking about are where it was enhanced and taken to another level. When you read Matthew chapter 5, in several instances, Jesus says, you've heard it said. And he is quoting the Old Testament law. He's quoting the moral law. And then he says, but I say to you, he is not deleting it. He is enhancing it. So, when we look at what was handed over, most of it still applies to us today. And we looked at a few examples. For example, in, within the moral law, Exodus 20 verse 12, we are expected to honor our father and mother. And when we come to the New Testament, in Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, this is enhanced. It is brought back. It is something we need to do. When the scriptures tell us that we should not covet or we should not steal, Paul brings it back to us. In the book of Romans chapter 13, where he urges us to love one another, where he urges us to work with our own hands. So this is still binding to us. When the Lord tells us that we shall not have any other gods before 
the Lord God Almighty. Amateka we gakula bulango obuta banga na katondo mla ukujia ukatondo mwenza wa imintu vionda. Because when you have them, that is idolatry. Buo gata keche la katondo obo ingi debi bumbi. And idolatry is condemned in the New Testament. Munda gane nkade mpia ne ukusinze ibi bumbi bachi tugana. So basically what the point is this, that with respect to the Moloro, this is still in effect for you as a believer. Now there is the other part which we call the ceremonial law. So this deals with the sacrificial system that was made up of the high priests and the other priests and the Levites, the different sacrifices that were made, the offerings that were given, the different festivities, all those compounded together. This ceremonial law pointed to Jesus Christ and was therefore fulfilled in the life and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Christ Jesus, the ceremonial law was abolished. That is why today you cannot make sacrifices. Because all all these laws were pointing to Christ. And now that he came, they are no longer effective. Then there is what we call the civil law, which is the third aspect that we are looking at. So this was relating to how God's people were supposed to function as a society. So all these other laws are nigh for an eye the cities of refuge where a criminal would run to. So all these were set up. How to receive justice in, with respect to inheritance. All these cases all this was to govern the way people related with one another. And I did mention that this is not binding to us as believers in Jesus Christ. Because we are outside the promised land. However, there are some applications that we see transported in the laws that govern our land. And these are applicable based on the jurisdiction in which this has been applied. Now, having understood that, we then come to the aspect of why is the law important. So we understood that first of all, it gives us the knowledge of sin. So without the law, then you cannot know that there is an offense. But once there is a law, then when you go contrary to that law, then it is an infraction, it is an offense. And so without it, then you have no knowledge. With it, then you know there is an offense. The second use of the law, was to establish law and order in society. Because if there is no law, then everybody does what they think is right. And that creates chaos. That creates a pandemonium. That creates a state of lawlessness. The third use of the law is to guide our believers in Christian living. 
okulungamya omukrista yomukirizo okutambulya mu bulamu bwe kikrista and let me explain this before we come to jesus christ ngate tunaba ku jeri yesu kristo everybody is on the broad way that leads to destruction buliyo mali ko kubole lye gazi eri komekereza mu kuzikirira when we come to jesus christ we to jeri kristo we leave the broad way tuva ku kubole lye gazi where everybody does their thing eyo ngabuliyo mako la cha yaga and we now move on a narrow way nitujja ku kubole lye funda on a narrow way there are landmarks there are instructions on how best to move on this small path where that leads to eternal life kukubali ne funda muri mwe ndagiriro ezikuyamba okutambulya mu bulamu obukomekereza mu bulamu obutagwa and it is this journey that we embark on that is the journey of sanctification we rugendo retu tandiko olwo mitendero jo kwaulibwa so in this sense we there are certain applicable rules that we need to follow. Era muri muna amateka gatutekedwa gobedira. Because here we are living a life that honors God. Vanga tuba tutandiso obulabo obuwesa katonde ekitibwa. So the fourth one, omugaso gwokuna is that the law gives us the knowledge of who God is. Amateka gatuyambo okutegera katonda. So in the law there are certain aspects of God that we see. Amateka galina e we for example get to know that god is so veering so you understanding that god is so veering is based on his law so that means he has the right to impose the lord was because he has authority over our lives Through the law we see God's holiness. Here is where we have a distinction between right and wrong. Between good and evil. When you take God out of the equation, then the dividing line gets disappears and soon it is gray and not black and white so also through the law we are able to see the god of love because he points us into the direction of our blessing kubanga ya tulage kubo eliyo mukisa when god says do this katonda wakugamba kola bwoti he is simply saying don't do this chategeza anti tokola chidi so when he says don't do this then he is saying do this wakugamba tokola bwoti alinga kugambe na yesala wokole bwoti so he is guiding you to the full expression of his blessing in your life aba tande so kulu ngamyo tambulire mu mukisa gwo mu bujuvu bwago when you go away from what he has prescribed for you what you will experience is his loving discipline kati mukwagala kwe agenda kukangavula so what this entails is us seeing god for who he really is kati mu mujjo kutegerira aichitufu katonda chali and that comes out for with us understanding what the law is all about ero mu mujjo kutegerira obukulu bwa mateka now having understood that we brought to the table netwanjula two schools of thoughts enjigiriza za bikabibili which are both extreme streams on the first extreme is what we call legalism now legalism simply says you have to observe the law in order for you to be saved or to be accepted by god now this form of legalism is on the extreme and we will see Paul reverting to this one so there is the other school of the law Uh, this school of thought believes that you need to keep 
the civil law or the ceremonial law in order to be sanctified. Bobo na ya uribwa kwata mateko ba semateka net na mateka ge mikolo. And what do these people do? They go to the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And they pick the ideas from them. And they impose this to the daily life of a believer. Now what we need to understand is that that part of the law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The third portion of legalism is where they take the law and then add to it. So they will come up with everything that is not in the law itself and try to amplify what is in the law but adding to what they, they believe. And that then creates a tradition. To it. And this is also an extreme that we need to be aware of. Because it has no biblical support. Now there is the other, we've seen this extreme which is legalism. Then there is the other extreme which we call antinomianism. So antinomianism, these are people who believe that the entire law does not apply. So there is no moral to fulfill you have the license to live whichever way you want to live. So, this, when we read the Bible, is the exact opposite of what the Bible is saying. So, the proper balance is somewhere in the middle where we need to honor the moral law. When God says you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not take my name in vain. You shall not make a graven image of or an idol. You shall honor your father and mother. You shall not steal. You shall not bear fault witness. You shall not covet. This still applies to us. We are to honor this we are to be obedient to this. And we do it through the power of the Holy Spirit who is dwelling within us. In Ezekiel chapter 36, from verse 26 to 27, this was what God had prophesied would happen. And this has already happened. What did God prophesy? He said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And he says in 27, I will put my spirit within you. And what was the purpose? He says, and I will cause you to walk in my studies. That you will keep my judgments and you will do them. 
Look at, and this is what happens to us at the new birth. So when we are born again, God takes out the heart of stone and he puts in us the heart of flesh. Then he writes his law upon our hearts. And then he gives us his spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit who then enables us to walk in obedience to the statutes that are imprinted on our hearts. Now that we have the Spirit in us, now that we have in your heart, we are now empowered to be able to walk not according to our former sinful desires, but now according to the lead of the Spirit. So it is against that background then that Paul comes to us in chapter 7 in the first verse and he begins by first of all bringing a general principle this general principle you would call it an axiom it is like you are arguing in a legal language. So you first put forward the general principle or the rule. And so this is what you state is what is generally known and applied. And look at what he's saying. He says, do you not know, brethren? Let's look at who is addressing here. He is addressing the brethren. He is addressing the believers. And he says, for I speak to those who know the law. Which law is he talking about? He is not talking about the mosaic law. Here he is talking about the general law law that governed the state of Rome. So these were the laws that any Roman citizen was obliged to live by. And now he says, for I speak to those who know the law. That the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Basically what he's trying to say is that the law has jurisdiction over somebody. And the Greek word he uses there is the word kurievo. It is from Kurievo that we get the word Kurios, which means Lord. So when we talk about Jesus Christ the Lord, the Lord is the word Kurios. So when we talk about Kurievo, it is talking about having dominion. Have exercising lordship over. So every citizen, what Paul is trying to address here is that every citizen has a binding obligation to keep the law of the land in which he lives. So, if you are in Uganda, for example, then you are bound by the laws of the nation of Uganda. And this is not in conflict with what God is stating. So, the only way where you will be expected to digress is where it contradicts the law of God. And this applies to you as a believer. So, 
we will see later why this is important because we will see later that even our rulers are appointed by God. They are his ministers to us. But the point I want to draw here, he's trying to state to us that this jurisdiction only applies as long as a person is alive. So even when you age, it still applies. It will only cease to apply when you cease to live. So that is the principle Paul lays in verse 1. Now having laid down the principle, he then draws us to the analogy or the example. And here he comes to verse 2 and verse 3. Where he states for, a, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband leaves, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Now, here Paul is Discuss, seems to be discussing adultery and remarriage. Which, which seems to be going contrary to the argument he's bringing forward. But look at the way he begins. He says, for the married woman. And the use of the word for, he's simply drawing from the, he's drawing a conclusion from the earlier argument. So what he's trying to say is in the same way when the husband is still alive, a woman should not remarry. Or should not be joined to another man. Because when she does that, then she has committed adultery. Why? Because she is still legally married to her husband. And this is the point. This is the analogy he is drawing to our attention. But without digressing deeper into marriage and remarriage, I will point out two exceptions to this rule which the Bible gives us in the New Testament. And one exception is where there is sexual adultery by the other partner. And this is given to us in Matthew chapter 5 from verse 31 to 34 and Matthew chapter 19 verse 9. The other exception is where which we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 15 where the unbeliever deserts the marriage. Now, I will not go into depth on that. Uh, I need to do, take us back here to what Paul is trying to address. And he's saying, if the husband dies, 
Babwa fa. Then is she's free from the law. Aba sumuru duo kuva mute. So she's no longer an adulteress. Aba tacha ite wa mwezi. She's free to marry. Wademo kufu. So what Paul is trying to do yes is to give us the clear picture of the general principle in verse 1. Paulo atuyambo kutegele nono jata ndese mwenye yorusoka. And then in verse 4. He then brings the personal application. And he says, therefore, my brethren. So here is where he's drawing our attention back. To try and connect what he's trying to say concerning our sanctification. And he says, therefore, brethren, you were made to die. So we chitio baganda bange namwe mwafa to the law through the body of Christ. Kumateka okuita mubiri gwa Kristo. I want you to see who is addressing here. He's talking about the brethren, the believers. Ategeza bakiriza. And he's saying you were made to die. Timwe mwafa. So there is a time in your past. Chitekeza wali wakasera mubulamu when you were made to die to the law. We so he is trying to say something here that the day you were justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that is the day when you went from being the slave to sin and you became a slave to righteousness at that point in time this is what happened you were made to die to the law now this is something that was done by the grace of God. So what is it that he's trying to say? What does he mean when he said you die to the law or you're made to die to the law? In what sense did we die to the law? So we die to the sense in to the law in the sense that we are no longer we no longer have to meet its requirements to gain acceptance to God. And why is that important? This came about because Jesus perfectly obeyed the law for us. In Galatians 4, verse 4, the Bible says Jesus was born under the law. So for the 33 years of his life, he met every demand of the law on your behalf. So in order to secure your salvation, he not only died for us, he also lived for us. I want you to digest this for a moment. He did not just die for you, but he also lived for you. So he not only sacrificed himself on the cross for us, but he also obeyed the law on our behalf. So when you place your faith in him, you die to the law. So how do you die to the law? How is this possible? How does this come about? Paul explains that this is achieved through the body of Christ. Now when he's talking about the body of Christ here, he's not talking about the church. And that's where my Roman Catholic 
friends get it wrong. When he's talking about the body of Christ here, he is talking about the physical body of Jesus Christ. Why? Because through his incarnation, he fulfills the demands of the law by living a sinless life. And so when he dies, this death is substitutionary. So he dies in our place. So, and now as a second Adam, he succeeds where the first Adam failed. Remember the first Adam failed the test of obedience. Now the second Adam lives all his life in obedience. So he succeeds where the first Adam failed. So when we place our faith in the second Adam, we are now born again in the new lineage of the, new, of the second Adam. Number three, as the great high priest, he now offers himself Remember, it is not just the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice and he was the priest. So he offered up himself on the cross to fulfill the ceremonial law. Remember, in the Old Testament, it is the high priest that made that sacrifice on behalf of all the people. So Jesus as the high priest now makes this sacrifice on our behalf. On behalf of all that place their faith in him. But remember, he had to take the blood of the lamb. And he is the lamb that takes out the sins of the world. So with his own blood, he now makes an offering on behalf of everyone that believes on him. Now, when you place your faith in him, you will die to all the requirements of the ceremonial law. So everything you are not able to fulfill out of your own effort, you now surrender it to him. So he takes this heavy yoke of the law that you cannot fulfill. And now this is what happens. Through the Spirit, you are now able to walk with him in obedience to this moral law. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. See, having died to the law, the believer can now serve Christ. And Paul here uses a phrase that brings refreshment to us. He says we do this in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the later. Basically, what he's trying to state is this. 
when you become dead to the law through the body of Christ, you now begin to bear fruit to God. Previously, you bore fruit, but it was the fruit to death. But now you have been delivered from all that. Not based on what you did, but based on what Christ has done. And now what this does to you, and I, we are now put in a position where we are now able to serve we are now able to live. We are now able to execute or live a life that is pleasing to God. And this we do in obedience to the Spirit of God and not in the oldness of the letter. What is it that is trying to bring home? That you and I can now live in obedience to the moral law. God. in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in our old sinful flesh. So the Spirit now causes you to love God more than anything or anyone. So the spirit at work in your life changes your affection, changes your tastes. So you now worship God in the most adverse of circumstances. It's It's amazing. There are places I've been to where in the standards of life people are not that well off. But the joy of the Lord is so evident among them. The peace with God is so infectious that you, you see God alive in them. You see God working with them. You see the love of God being, being so revealed. And this happens because of what has taken place. Now this newness of the spirit is available to them. So you don't worship God because you have one million dollars. All you have paid all your dues. Dues paid, dues not paid, you still praise the name of the Lord. This is important. Because if that doesn't happen, then you move to, you can only worship God or love God because there is an external stimuli. So that's why people light candles, have scapulars, have rosaries, have have statues, uh, put on a particular cloth. Uh, and the reason to that is to try to stimulate them. To worship God. What that in shows that there is the absence of the indwelling of the Spirit. Because the indwelling of the Spirit magnifies God. It is this Spirit 
the Holy Spirit who leads you to worship. So if you don't have that, then you will have to rely on the music, you have to rely on somebody to manipulate your heart to you, for you to get into a mode of worship. But once the spirit of the Lord dwells in you, then the spirit leads you. The book of Romans tells us that as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the children of God. The Holy Spirit is the testimony. It is, he is the evidence that we are born again. He is the evidence that we have died to the law. So the Holy Spirit now leads you down that path of freedom in obedience to what God has laid down for you. So basically what this means that you are not free to do everything and anything you want. For, for example, you are not free to live an adulter in an adulterous relationship. So, so if you are a believer and you still hold to this, I even wonder whether you actually are a believer. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, you obey the Spirit. And the Spirit will convict you. There will be the shells and they shall not of life. And this you follow based on what the leading of the Spirit is. And so, for example, if the spirit of the command of the Lord says, you shall not steal. So what is he trying to say? So the spirit brings the applied to you. So if you are not going to steal, what are you going to do? Then you've got to live in honesty. You will work with your hands and believe God to bless the work of your hands. And when the Lord blesses the work of your hands, the scripture will be fulfilled that the blessing of the Lord makes rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. You see, when the Bible says, you, or the commandment of God says, you shall not lie. What is he trying to say? He's saying, use your mouth for the opposite. So what then you use your mouth for the good. So instead of lying about people, instead of gossiping about people, then you use your mouth to edify. So you use your mouth to utter what is praiseworthy. You use your mouth to build up people. Where then the command says you shall not covet. What does the spirit do? He brings you the application to that. And then you get content with what you have. With where you are. So when the spirit, when the commandment says you shall not commit adultery. So what does the spirit then do to you? As a, a married person. As a husband then the Spirit of the Lord convicts you to love your wife. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So if the commandment says honor your father and mother, then the spirit of the Lord begins the work in you. Uh, 
taking you along this path where you live in submission to authority that God places over you. So you begin to respect your teachers in school. You begin to respect the people that God places as authority over your life. And for everyone that has genuinely been saved. This has become part of your journey of transformation. I, I've had many encounters with the Holy Spirit where he has pointed out several areas in my life that need to be changed. And I have allowed him on this journey of transformation and I have seen the results in my life. And I invite you as well everywhere you are to get to understand that this law of God is beneficial to you. The scriptures tell us that if we are willing and obedient we shall eat the good of the land. Therefore I'm inviting you my brother, my sister watching us to understand that God has given us the law. We need to understand that the law has a giver. And the giver has a goal in mind. And if we align ourselves properly and have a perfect understanding of what God has put before us and cooperate with the Spirit of God, we will walk through a path of blessing and peace as God has willed for our lives. Therefore, if you are watching us today and have never believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is where it all begins. The Lord says, I've placed before you life and, death. and he says, choose life. Today, you can choose life. And this life is Jesus Christ Himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Life without Jesus is death. Life is only found in a person. Life is the person of Jesus Christ. Today, I invite you to take life. Surrender your life to him. And he will guide you from this day forward. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And he will give you a new heart. And you will now walk in the newness of life. In the newness of the Spirit. On this narrow way that leads to eternal life. So you are there, never received Jesus in your life as your personal Lord. Why don't you say these words with me? Mean them from the bottom of your heart. And today God will give you a new heart. And you have a new direction in life and you have the life of God in you. Say these words with me from the bottom of your heart. Say God of heaven, creator of the universe, I thank you for this day. I am a sinner. I need a savior the Savior who gives life. And this is none other than Jesus Christ who came and lived on this earth fulfilled the whole, whole law of God and died in my place. 
Today I receive you, Jesus, as both Lord and Savior in my life. Fill me with your spirit and guide me on this journey of faith. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. If you say these words, your life has been changed. There is the number on the screen. I'm requesting, please, please call that number. Tell us what God has done in your life. God has turned everything from darkness to light from death to life you will receive the new instructions on how to move along this journey everything changes today for the believer in Jesus Christ I believe you have been mightily blessed today. So let's catch up next week. As we continue on this journey of understanding how we relate with the law. The law of God. The loving Father. So till we meet again from Dominion Church. It's been a pleasure having you. God Richard bless you. Shalom.